speak on a topic uh, which is uh, maybe not in the basic lessons and not in the elementary understanding of geoinformatics. Not so much talking about what is where and why is it there and why do we care about that? So not only to talk about location and attributes in location, but talk about movement. Yeah, movement, this is the change of location. Uh, this might be the rate of change in location. Then we call it speed or velocity. Is what actually drives our society. That's uh, what generates many of our business and economics processes. If nothing moves, nothing happens, right? So that's why I would like to talk about this topic a little bit today. And with that, I would like to explain to some degree uh, the phrase in the title I've been using for today's talk, which maybe has come as a surprise to some of you, but I was talking about a line, uh, which is a dot which went for a walk. So the dot as the elementary uh, signifier of location of what is where, all of a sudden moves. And as I said, this is uh, critically important for the processes in our societies. So to start as a two minute mini lesson here, we are familiar with lines, with polylines, which are built from nodes and vertices and maybe represent a road or a power line or a pipeline. Uh, there are nodes at the beginning and the end. There is location with X, Y and maybe X, Y, Z. Uh, and when we have two such locations, then we can measure the distance. So we're all very familiar with that. If we now add another dimension by adding time, not adding X and Y, but T as well, then of course we can determine, again, the weight of change in location, speed, and we can maybe look at how fast something has been moving over this stretch of road, how the traffic is moving, how we individually can travel, uh, and you can think yourself of many other examples. So we simply add time to our lines, to each and every vertex. We build a temporal sequence, sequence over time, we do not, as we've seen, not only work with a gradient and velocity, and we have to be aware that actually trajectories, which are kind of the traces of movement in space, do not really leave behind a permanent line. They are transient. So if someone or something, a vehicle, travels along this trajectory, it's not permanently present there, it's just moving past. So if someone else travels on their trip, those two red dots do not necessarily meet because they are, have, have been in the same place at this intersection point right here, but they haven't been at this intersection point at the same time. This should just illustrate that a trajectory is a different spatial, a different geoinformatics feature compared to our traditional lines or polylines. So we can see that such relationships like intersecting or meeting, <clears throat> sorry, only exist in time or can be aggregated as densities over time. And it's quite important to decide upon the sampling of any recording of a trip or trajectory. I like to call these trajectories and the uh, work we are doing here uh, within the context of relational geography, the geometric dimension of relational geography. Now, this term of relational geography might not be that familiar to you. It is based not on 
local observations about points, lines, and areas, but relational geography is based on links. These represent the flow of water or goods interactions with telecommunication between people, connections by wire, by pipeline, by road, or social connections between people, or the diffusion of maybe innovation over time. And relational geography based on these links creates what we call functional regions. This might be an urban region with uh, the commuting patterns we maybe look at. So we work with what we call binary attributes, attributes which describe a link maybe between two cities or between a source and the destination of something instead of unary attributes which only relate to a single static and stable point or line of polygon. So these paths, we call these trajectories, either leave a trace with vertices, or they are simply origin destination links, like the flight from one city to another, or maybe like the call from one location to our friends or family we are giving. So relational geography uh, generates areas or networks, and these represent what we can call in the widest possible sense, transfer processes in space and in economy and in society. So this relational uh, geography is here was established. So all of the following examples, and yes, the lecture part of my talk is mostly over. I will focus more on examples from there on. Uh, are the geometric dimension of relational geography. They are based on time-enabled polylines representing movement, which we call trajectories. And quite often, we really talk about big data today in this context. Formally, when we wanted to learn about travel, about commuting, we maybe were giving people a questionnaire. Now, with our mobile phones, we track, sometimes involuntarily, many, many movements. The same applies for telecom data and many other ones. So when I maybe record the movement of people around a big city like that, it's too much data. Yeah. So we have to reduce these data. We have to consolidate the travel into tracks and then find notes. This would be way too much to analyze. So again, big data analytics or spatial data science has become a key dimension of what we are doing of our work in geoinformatics, making sense of a flood of data, extracting information for decision support from this huge flood of too much of a good thing. Of course, these don't have these links, these relations don't have to be physical movements in the city or in the country. They can be just links. Think about all of your social media friends or relations or followers being mapped to their location. So with every social media platform, we can establish this kind of a network. And again, that would tell us a lot about the relations between societies in different countries. Or maybe we talk about simple migration patterns or what is the graphic in this particular example. It's the daily commuting patterns to one major town from its surrounding municipalities. So this is one of the key and one of the classic examples of relational geography, and I would actually encourage everyone, and I would like to encourage in particular young researchers to focus on this topic of relational analysis, to learn more about the dynamics of our cities, of our countries, not consider this 
uh, our geography, our atlas, our map views, static representations of what is or what has been, but rather explore the dynamics in our countries. Sometimes we do this by following actual movement tracks. That would be the example on the right-hand side, where we look at the geometry, at the actual location where travel, where transport, where movement happens. And sometimes we are only interested in the origin and the destination of any kind of communication or link. So if we talk about air travel, if we talk about phone calls, about links in the internet, then the pure topology dimension, which is represented with the animation on the left-hand side would be certainly good enough. This is a railway network, a part of the railway network in my country. And it shows me that all movements can happen in different dimensions. When we are bound to follow a line, when we travel by car, by train, then we talk about one dimensional constraint movement. Another example would be the movement of ships on an ocean. And I'm not talking about flying boats or diving boats here. And with that constraint, uh, we can consider the travel on a water surface a two-dimensional movement thing, movement in two-dimensional space, as opposed to the railway, which was constrained to 1D. So that's the 2D case. And then there is, of course, the three-dimensional case of movement, uh, which would happen, for instance, with airline travel, when we are moving in three-dimensional space. The trajectory would then look like this. So we have uh, X and Y location. These would be the vertices we've looked at before. Uh, and elevation, yeah, that's the height in feet. And then there is the velocity and the rate of change in elevation. So that would be an example for a 3D trajectory. Mm -hmm. And in order to manage air travel, to coordinate the blue arriving airplanes with the departing green airplane symbols, well, all of this would be examples for the spatial analysis, for the application of geoinformatics to the analysis of all kinds of movements in 1D, in 2D, and in 3D. So where do all of these data come from? You've seen three examples, all of them from the physical transport, uh, railway, shipping airplanes. But of course, these days, many, many services, uh, partly by design, partly, as I had mentioned, involuntarily, create a lot of data. That's why we talk about the big data analytics, the spatial data science approaches, which are urgently needed in our discipline. Delivery services, food delivery, any other, fitness apps and fitness watches, smartphones by their pretty much each and every use, indoor tracking, the tracking of uh, animals, for instance, for ecological research. You might look at the Move Bank Open Data Repository. All of these create a lot of data, of movement data. Sometimes we focus on the demand and supply so for instance, if we use a hail ride service, Uber taxis in this part of the world, this would be the time aggregated demand for people calling for such a taxi. So when we do modeling for the providing of this kind of services, it would be very good to know that demand. So we are trying to not only record what is there, but we are trying to record what has happened yesterday to have a better model 
for the forecast for offering taxi services, hail white services today and maybe tomorrow. Or when we actually look at the movement by this project actually has focused on bicycle travel by children to school, then we want to aggregate these trips and look at the density of travel, maybe to improve the infrastructure, to widen the road, to provide public transport service, or maybe to provide a, a bike trail in this particular region. So there is, as we can see, a broad range of application disciplines for movement analysis. It's clearly transportation, public transport and logistics for goods. It's the application of general infrastructure planning. We know that the value of real estate is determined uh, by the probability or the ease of reaching maybe centers. We go into the field of spatial econometrics and talk about park chains, delivery chains uh, in business. And we might be just as well interested in spatial ecology. I'd mentioned the move bank briefly before. And of course, in many sports, people are moving. So we sometimes analyze in all kinds of different sports, how one particular sports person is performing running a lot, running where the coach told them to run, interact with other players or avoiding to interact with other players. So this is movement just as well. Not that business serious maybe, but I still believe it's a good illustration. So with these trajectories, we have to do analysis. Again, like with every data set, data in itself is not that valuable. Even if sometimes it's called the new oil or the new gold in information society. I would dispute that. Data is not that important, but we are interested in information to support decisions. How do we create information from data? Well, that's analysis. That's what we call spatial analysis. And when we look at traces of movements at trajectories, then we analyze whether these traces meet or not, what's the distance between different observations, the density of these observations, or how much traffic aggregated, how many people are at the same place at the same time, but maybe also the visibility between moving objects and multimodal transport, like I walk to a train station and then take the train and then the last mile, I take a bus. So this would be a modeling of multimodal transport. So there's a lot of research themes, and they certainly go beyond uh, traditional visualization and data models, which uh, like we had looked at in the first minutes of this talk, how to represent trajectories. This is all about spatiotemporal relations or geofencing, and I'll show you an example for that in a minute, or the optimization of schedules for delivery or for public transport, and to check whether a transport the, uh, shipping delivery service actually adheres to whatever is planned. So what is geofencing? Well, we are checking whether anyone stays in a designated area as a person with the vehicle because maybe they are the maintenance person for the power network in this field. Or that would be the opposed case, whether anyone touches an area where they should not go, right? So we have live movements of people, of vehicles, and then uh, we relate these to fixed areas. So there are two events, and these are events from a computational science, from an IT point of view. Exiting, leaving a geofence, an area, which is defined by, for instance, a simple polygon, or entering this. These are the events, and then we can trigger measures. 
Another uh, important research area is the bundling of trajectories. So when we measure, when you measure a trip with GPS, you know, you take this trip 10 times, you take exactly the same route, uh, but the recording will be slightly different for technical reasons many of us are very well aware of. Now, when we do that kind of recording with vehicles on the roads, we would get a pretty messy data set, like the one you see in the upper middle of this sketch. If what actually we want to have as an extracted data set is the maybe two lanes on this road uh, in the bottom middle. So we want to convert the actual measurements on the top into the traces where vehicles or people are actually moving on the bottom of the screen. That's an interesting aspect out there. So anyone who is more interested in this movement data research in geoinformatics, uh, this link, uh, and you'll see that, you can read that on the left-hand side of the slide, is maybe the best starting point. Anyone who is looking for an interesting PhD thesis topic, and you are interested in the actual movement in the dynamics of economy and society, of people and goods and vehicles. You might want to explore this blog. You would get lots of ideas for further research. With this, I would like to close for today and just focus on the uh, clear perspective, which is kind of the common denominator for essentially all of geoinformatics. Uh, we are all living in the real world. We are interested in managing the real world. But in order to do that, we build digital models. Sometimes we call these digital twins of the real world. And then as people, we interact with these digital models in order to reach better decisions for managing the real world. Thank you. And I wish you a great start into the conference. Goodbye. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, good morning, dear colleagues. And it's my great honor to have an opportunity to be invited and give a, uh, give a uh, speech in the opening ceremony of this uh, uh, very uh, important and very uh, nice uh, conference uh, today. Um, I uh, I would like to start my uh, screen sharing now. Um, okay, I hope uh, my screen is. Uh, Oh, sorry, uh, go to the first page. Okay. Um, uh, is it successful to share my screen? Yes. Okay. And 
it's my great honor and uh, I would like to give an, uh, uh, some uh, introduction about the, our research work and uh, about uh, the, the Tarim River. Most of the people who are uh, living in Central Asia must be, uh, maybe they are very familiar with uh, this uh, uh, great uh, river system. And my topic is in the challenges and opportunities for application of geoinformation for the riparian ecosystem restoration and the management. And uh, this was an, uh, uh, systematic project in China for restor restoring uh, the damaged ecosystem along the, the, uh, along the uh, Karim River. And uh, this is an, uh, the, Uh, look at in the history a lot of an uh, expedition from the former Soviet Union or from Russian and European visited in this region and also they made some record about this area. Um, <clears throat> in the 1972, because of a uh, uh, lot of water demand for the de agriculture developing in this region, in the middle reach and upper reach of the main Tarim River basin, so they uh, built in the several uh, reservoirs, especially in 1972, the Tashkol reservoir was built up in this region and it's completely blocked the water to transferring the lower reach of the, this river. And actually this is in a green corridor, which is connected in the no Northern part of Teklamakan and the, uh, uh, the oasis in the Northern Tarim Basin and also Southern Tarim Basin. Uh, that is uh, caused a lot of ecological problem and the damaging of ecosystem, especially degradation of the of the vegetation. Um, this is uh, what the ecosystem structure looks like in the Tarim Basin, uh, especially the lower ridge. And we can see the green corridor along the rivers, uh, river channel, and also some mosaics and the, the matrix, especially the background is in the desert. And also we have uh, several patches of uh, uh, different types of vegetation and also marshland or also uh, wetland. And in 2000, the central government uh, realized that uh, keeping the green corridor is very important because of we have an, uh, one important highway connecting this region to the in, uh, inland of China. And also there are only two uh, 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 highway connecting the Xinjiang to, uh, to the in the inland China. So, uh, and also the eco uh, economical development uh, requests a lot of uh, transportation via this uh, highway. And also uh, the central government decided to build a railway in this area for having more transportation uh, capacity uh, because of uh, reach of uh, resources in this region, especially oil in the Tarim Basin. And then we, uh, in the central government decided to support 8.43 billions of uh, uh, the dollars actually to uh, support the, uh, the local government to start the, the ecosystem restoration project for the entire uh, Tarim River Basin. Special focus is the lower Tarim River, which is about uh, 430 kilometers. Um, they uh, uh, transported almost uh, 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 sorry, uh, this almost uh, transported the 8.43 uh, billion cubic meter water to this region and uh, uh, by the 24 times and in the last 20 years. And after that, the, there is an, uh, some question is rising, especially, and should we spend such amount of water and such a lot of money uh, to restore this ecosystem and what will be uh, benefit for us? or uh, what is a uh, uh, real object of the restoration or a target of the restoration. So uh, there are several questions need to be answered and especially what the ecosystem looks like before uh, it was damaged and how to define the targets of the ecosystem restoration and where the water should go into and where the water actually running and what is the response of the vegetation uh, to the uh, water transfer uh, transfer uh, uh, transferring project 
and what is a possible strategy to for keep the ecosystem completeness and also if the ecosystem can be sustainable or not, even if we are uh, interrupting this uh, water progress, any optimization and also what landscape pattern is most optimal due to the limited water resource because a lot of uncertainties due to the, uh, the uh, due to the snow and the uh, ice melting water resources from the mountain area, and also the uh, rapid economical development in this entire region. So we designed a uh, research uh, general research framework for collecting the, the different multi uh, source of data, especially uh, focusing about on the maps and the historical cartographies or something like that, and then. We try to find and uh, to answer the first question, what looks like before? Because if we don't know what it looks like and it's, it's not easy for us to define what is real target for, uh, for uh, uh, restoring this ecosystem. And then we looked at and some historical uh, uh, documents, uh, expedition diary or sharing diary expedition reports or something like that. And then we found, um, sorry, my slide doesn't, run. okay. And then we found almost more than 100 uh, maps which was made by European cartographers in the past. Some of them is based on the field work of our traveling. Some of them are uh, some, uh, uh, perhaps some other sources like a uh, businessman or uh, uh, along the Silk Road, perhaps. And then we found some of them on the website. And, uh, um, okay, then we looked at and in more detail any uh, uh, information for in these kind of um, uh, uh, maps. Then we can see here the desert, the Lop, Lop desert was um, recorded in this map, even it was made in the 1570 and later also in the 18th century, there is also uh, uh, those desert was mentioned with some river and it's not accurate, but anyway, it tells uh, tell us uh, uh, people are know, know uh, there are some uh, river and also. In this map in the 18th uh, century, and uh, this river, the Lopnor Lake was uh, mentioned and also this river is also, uh, uh, drawn here, but the name was not Tarim River, it was in the Yerkan River. And Yerkan is so, uh, at that time, it was not uh, mapped by the, the people who really visited here, but perhaps some other information. And then in the uh, beginning of 20th century, Huntington visited here and he made a map like this, and he clearly uh, right, it's in the Yorkant River or a Tarim River because the local people also use the Tarim as an uh, uh, as in the name of the, the main uh, stream of this river. And then also the Swin Hedden also made a map and also he gave a more accurate uh, uh, information about the lower reach of the Tarim River, including the Lopnor, but, uh, and also the, some uh, wetland or, or marshland Around, uh, around this uh, turning point of the Tarim River. And then some other uh, maps also uh, I didn't uh, di uh, discover it and uh, some of them we didn't uh, uh, get an original map, only some portion of the map from the web and still need to be uh, collected. And you can see a lot of an, uh, 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 water body or say uh, some surface water and there's a lot of uh, river channels was also indicated in this map and also some drawing, drawings and uh, from different uh, uh, documents also identified. And uh, in the end, we, uh, when we checked all the maps and we realized that this uh, 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 certain maps which has a uh, geographic coordinate and also the map scale, it's more useful for doing some research. And this is, looks like and from uh, different uh, sources. Um, <coughs> We uh, georeferenced all this data to the, the ArcGIS software and then make an overlap and then digitize it all uh, necessary information from this uh, river channels and the water body. And then we uh, produced and the, the map uh, uh, water body landscape 
in that period. And also we collected some photographs and, uh, for, uh, sorry, uh, we also uh, uh, found some photographs, which is uh, possibly can give, give us depth, uh, the information about depths of the water for making the volumetric measurement, because we know the surface of the water, but we didn't understand about, we don't know about volumetric uh, volume of the water. That is a uh, real uh, key information for understanding about the water resources. And then we entered the remote sensing era and we have an archive with uh, many types of remote sensing data, including the Corona data for 1960s and the 70s. And we can see this area also very uh, clearly, uh, uh, clearly, uh, uh, discover, uh, clearly well find here. And also we can see some small lakes in the desert at that time. And then in, in the 1970s, we also have an Landsat uh, satellite uh, series, and especially later, a lot of countries are developed on the Landsat-like satellites, like, for example, like in the Chinese Brazilian Earth Resources Satellite, and also the uh, HJ, it's an environmental and uh, and uh, uh, natural disaster monitoring small satellite by China. And the same, uh, same sensors uh, 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 designing within the Landsat. And then it makes it easy for us to uh, collect more data about and more frequently, frequent uh, surface data for uh, doing the, the, the monitoring and the research. And then uh, we are for answering the where the where are the water. We are using different sources like topographic, topographic maps also, and especially we are using the the uh, satellite image images. And actually, we did in, uh, more satellite images. This is on the selected uh, uh, some of the selected uh, the images here. So then we can see about the uh, uh, total water surface area and also number of patches of the water, and also the largest patch and other indica uh, indicators was analyzed uh, based on this data. So it was um, very important for us to understand what happened after we started the eco ecological water transferring, because uh, it was started to design, decided in 2000 and started uh, the first uh, water transferring in the two, 2000. And as a comparison, we started from the 1999, and then we have uh, some comparison here. So it's clearly tell us the, the, the water and also the, especially the vegetation area was an uh, uh, increase. And this is a uh, water landscape pattern. And in, in the, uh, uh, the uh, before the 60s in 20th, uh, 20th century, we identified more than 2,000 square kilometers of the water surface can be identified because most of them are coming from the topograph map. But the problem is sometimes the topograph map will not give us exact and water surface area, but the lake area. So it, there's a lot of uncertainties because some of the lake was uh, temporal, uh, temporarily uh, dried or something. So it's not easy for us to understand and uh, how accurate it is. But anyway, it tell us more water, uh, surface water is exist at the time. And then we combine it and the historical uh, uh, records and from the Simon Hedin, for example, and also the, the topograph map, which was made in 1959, based on aerial photography and the later using the satellite images to understand some uh, lakes and uh, uh, alongside of the of the Karim River, uh, what happened, and then we can see this, this and the steel from the uh, Seminhedin period to uh, the uh, 1960s, and it's still decreasing, decreasing, uh, and also in the uh, after the nine, 2001, it's uh, started to increasing again. So it means that uh, the water uh, transferring project is uh, made some uh, effect here. And also in other places, we can see that in the 70, 70, uh, 1967, we have an, uh, quite a large you know, water surface area here, but it was dried up. And then later it's uh, recovering again. So we can uh, identify many places 
uh, which is um, refilled by water and uh, gradually, and even the water is um, uh, temporarily stayed there for some uh, some times, for example, a couple of years, but then the vegetation was um, uh, uh, recovered quite a lot. For example, like Chivinkul River, uh, it was being um, quite a uh, large uh, reed covered uh, region, and especially. <clears throat> And then this Tetima Lake was an, uh, actually the terminal lake of the Parim River and the Cherchen River should be the Lopnor Lake. But uh, after 1960s and the uh, mostly the water couldn't reach to the Lopnor Lake and uh, instead of the Lopnor Lake, the Tetima Lake was being on the terminal lake of the Bost Lake. And then we uh, also checked about and uh, what happened in this terminal lake, and we can see in the 1960s there are still some water, and but uh, up to 1990s, uh, this area was completely dry. And from the uh, after starting to the uh, ecosystem uh, ecological water transferring, it's a starting to recovering, and but again dried once because of the lack of water in 2008, and later it's an uh, being uh, uh, larger and larger, and also being uh, uh, stable. And also, we uh, what uh, in if we look at this map, we can see a lot of uh, uh, lakes in the desert. And so, understanding to understand what when it what was happened and the, how which uh, river is made and the contribution to such a uh, uh, formation, and we uh, uh, tested all. The satellite images from 2017 to uh, identify when it it was uh, formed, and then we can find here in the 2002, and we don't have uh, we have only small uh, water uh, or was a eolic lakes was formed in this region, and the 2003 and the 2004 we can see, but to, uh, when in the 2010 we can uh, identify some. Uh, leak uh, happened in this part, and then we can see in the 2010, and uh, after during the four days, and this is, there is an, a new small lake was uh, forming. And in 2013, we, we can see during the, uh, the one day, the one of the 12 kilometers long uh, of the lake was formed after the uh, after breaking the sand uh, sand dune here. And then this is impossible to uh, impo impossible to detect such uh, uh, changes without using the high frequent remote sensing data. So the high frequent remote sensing data from multi source of uh, satellite it makes it possible to identify uh, such things. And then we can uh, have an uh, we have only one hydrological station in the Cherchen River, in the the Cherchen uh, County uh, uh, Cherchen. Uh, 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 city, and so we comparing these uh, changes together with a runoff of the Church and River. We can find all uh, the formation of the new lake is in, uh, related to uh, much uh, of a larger annual runoff of the Church and River. And then we also need to understand and the seasonal changes of this region. And we used an, uh, uh, very frequent uh, remote sensing data from Sentinel and also uh, GF uh, series of satellite from China to identify about the uh, water surface changes. And we realized that the water changing is uh, really uh, related to the water uh, from the Cherchen River more than Harim River actually in this region. And the, we understand about the surface, but we didn't have about the water depths because remote sensing, uh, it's easy to uh, measuring the surface, but the, the depth measurement is still challenging. We did a lot of field work for collecting a lot of uh, points for measuring the actual, uh, uh, actual uh, depths of the water for calculating uh, the water depths, and but the relative uh, depths water is an uh, uh, it's an uh, more uh, un understandable, but the absolute water depths by optical remote sensing is still challenging. Our research is uh, didn't give us a sufficient result uh, at the moment. We are still doing the, such a, a measurement, 
And the next uh, uh, question is about the response of vegetation in this area, especially what we say land cover change. And then for understanding the land cover change, we tested different uh, resolution of a satellite imagery, uh, how the accuracy will make an effect if we use different types of uh, satellite images and also combining the field work to measure and ecological factors of, of, uh, of the this poplar trees, for example. And then we uh, built in the GIS database uh, for each tree and each patch in this study area. And uh, uh, every five years, we will do the field work, the measurement and the comparing with and the high resolution satellite images and the medium resolution satellite images for long-term monitoring. And the two, I, and the, when we use the vegetation index, index is changing, but we, uh, we didn't understand what caused the fluctuation of the vegetation index. Then we need to uh, higher resolution satellite image, even it's uh, very expensive that, but we need to understand. So we use the high resolution image to understand. So we can see, there are some of the, the, the changes was uh, density changes of the, the vegetation and some of them are the extension of the patch. And so uh, this uh, uh, biomass changing is a, a, a different way. And also sometimes and we can find some uh, construction engineering effect and the changes of the, the, uh, the changes of the river. Uh, you can see here the construction of the artificial dam for uh, let the water going through and the faster to, to the lower ridge and then they block in this part and the later some of the uh, some of the plant uh, trees here was um, destroyed and also later the water surface and it disappeared from here and then we used an uh, landsat image to check and uh, if we can get in the same uh, uh, same accuracy, uh, uh, accuracy of the result. And then we uh, really uh, realized it that 30 meters of uh, monitoring for such uh, region. And because we, uh, the re requirement from the decision makers is then uh, uh, have a more accurate than vegetation map. So the 10 meet, uh, 30 meters is a little bit uh, a uh, uh, little bit uh, not sufficient, or what we say. And that then we, uh, this is an, uh, based on the 30 meters resolution, and we uh, constructed the trajectory, temporal trajectory of the vegetation change, because, and uh, this is on a very dynamic, and uh, if some uh, vegetation was uh, uh, recovered, but then uh, maybe, uh, some later without uh, the sub continuous supporting of water, it was an, uh, again a change into non vegetation. So we uh, we uh, established and uh, changed and non changed the pixels and the stable vegetation, stable non vegetation into vegetation and into non vegetation. And here is very important is unstable vegetation. We can see some theoretical uh, formulas here. And what is an uh, significant discovering of using this uh, multi-temporal uh, 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 remote sensing for establishing temporal territory is that we found we have an unstable change almost 10 percent almost 10 percent and it is almost equal to the vegetation change into vegetation uh, more than a change into vegetation and also even it's an more than stable vegetation. So this is a very important message for us to give and know what is a possible uh, priority uh, priority of the, the water supporting area for uh, uh, gaining more vegetation and something like that. So before we only use in the two uh, temporal, our three uh, temporal uh, data is not possible to uh, detect this part. And we also, uh, checked and uh, many sites for checking uh, accuracy uh, of that. And also the, now we have an UAV and it, it makes it possible to have an uh, even uh, centimeter is special resolution of uh, photogrammetry of uh, the vegetation. And then it makes up us the possible to build a 3D model of uh, vegetation and then test and how the roughness was uh, 
change it by the vegetation and the, how the, it was uh, effect to reducing the wind speed for uh, protecting the sur uh, surface soil. And the, the, this is our work team and the, thank you very much for your attention. And due to the limited time, I, uh, I want to stop my uh, uh, talk here uh, now. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to answer if any question from the audience. Thank you. So uh, now I would like to present just, uh, I would like to give just brief presentation about our uh, Erasmus Plus uh, Nikopo project. Why? Because uh, today's uh, conference is organized within this uh, project. And uh, now uh, we can see here uh, our uh, foreign guests who visit our university uh, from the partner universities uh, uh, of the Erasmus Plus Nikopo project. Not only in the project, but it is also uh, a Roland company, uh, distinguished guest uh, who is uh, coordinator of the, our previous Erasmus Plus Distinguished uh, Project. Uh, thank you all for uh, coming for visiting us. So uh, let me start out my presentation. Next slide, please. So, the uh, main aim of our uh, Nikopa project is a modernization of uh, the curriculum, uh, which is related to precision agriculture, gender maths, and uh, remote sensing uh, by applying PCPS, uh, European Credit System. This is uh, somehow <coughs> applying uh, of the Bologna process. And uh, actually, we have uh, started our project in 2000. Uh, 18 from November. Uh, last year we should uh, finish this project, but uh, because of COVID, uh, our project is extended for one year. And uh, this year on November, uh, we will finish our project. And uh, the uh, final congress of the project will be organized at the Kazakh Agrotechnical University, named after Nancy Kuli. So this project is uh, cross-regional. Why? Because uh, in this project participating uh, not only European uh, partner universities, for example, the uh, Agricultural University of Plovdiv, uh, Czech University of Life Sciences, uh, the Technical University, and the one organization uh, which is Exalange, uh, books of the satellite, satellites and geodesy. Uh, decision of the country and so on. And also, um, three universities from Kazakhstan, three universities from Turkmenistan, and three universities uh, from uh, Uzbekistan are participating. And the application uh, field is uh, agriculture, agricultural sector. So, in total, 31 organizations are participating in, the, in this uh, project. Uh, and the budget is about 1 million euro. Slide, please. So, uh, the main objective or aim of this project is to improve the quality of higher education and enhance its relevance for the labor market and society. Uh, the level of competence 
as uh, skills in the higher education institutions by developing new and innovative uh, education programs. Uh, also supporting the organization international internationalization of the higher education institutions. Precision agriculture and the targeted universities in Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan uh, through uh, the innovation of two cycles of uh, curricula, which is uh, bachelor and master study. Also, uh, the aim, one of the aim is bringing the higher education institutions uh, of precision agriculture to the labor market. Also, uh, we have already did, uh, we have already completed such uh, <coughs> objectives which are updating the current curricula, which is uh, related to uh, precision agriculture and uh, developing, implementing, uh, and accredi accrediting the new curricula in uh, other universities, including ECTS accredited. Next slide, please. So, um, According to the proposal of our project, we have uh, selected uh, nine core curricula modules and three transferable curricula, uh, which uh, which are which have been already uh, developed by the partner universities in Central Asia, and also uh, one of the main aim is uh, establishing precision agricultural service office which gives uh, uh, some services uh, consultations to the farmers or other uh, other organizations related to agriculture or precision agriculture. Uh, we have uh, joined the plat basic platform. We have a website, uh, which you can see on, on the left uh, lower corner of the slide. Uh, you can uh, get more information about this and uh, next slide, please. So you can see uh, detailed information uh, of the, our partner universities. Uh, and from them, we can see here on this call participating uh, the representatives of the partner universities from Kazakh uh, Technical University in Sikulim, Shokam Lehan Professor State University, North Kazakhstan State University in Kapas Marsh, Kuzubay. Uh, and unfortunately, our program, uh, our partner universities from Turkmenistan couldn't uh, participate, but uh, I think and I hope uh, they are participating online also. And also here on this call, participating the representatives from Tashkent University of Information Technologies and uh, from the National University of Uzbekistan, uh, the, the you know, representatives are participating. Uh, so next slide, please. We have also associated partners who help uh, our project, who can give advices uh, in educational sector and also in agricultural sector. Uh, for instance, uh, there are associated partners, which is previous, it was State Committee for the Resource of Geodesy and Cadastral. Uh, currently, it's a uh, cadastral agency of the government of Pakistan. And also uh, other ministries, uh, Minister of Education and Science uh, from Kazakhstan, uh, State Inspections for Supervision and Quality in Education of Uzbekistan, and Ministry of Education of Uzbekistan. Next. And you can see uh, the organic run of our project, how the project is managed by the uh, partner universities. And then there are some results which are related to our university, Tashkent Institute of Education and Agriculture and Engineers National Research University. So within our, this project, we have uh, established a new bachelor program which calls innovative technologies into uh, remote sensing and controlled you know, resources. And moreover, we have developed uh, 11 uh, key courses and uh, I would say uh, 10 of them in Uzbek and in the Russian language, and one uh, course which is precision agriculture is in English language. Next slide, please. So, yeah, last year, um, most of you remember, most of you participated in the opening ceremony of the Joint Research Center for 
of Jennifer Max, which is established within the uh, Erasmus Plus series and uh, Erasmus Plus Nicoba project. And uh, this joint research center includes the precision agricultural laboratory and virtual classrooms, and also precision agricultural service office, uh, which are uh, established within the Erasmus Plus Nicoba project. Later, there will be a video, a short video about the opening ceremony of this center, which we will show. So, for this uh, laboratory and virtual classroom, we have purchased uh, equipment, computers, and also uh, the equipment for soil analysis have been purchased and installed in this also our virtual classroom. Next. As you can see well, what kind of equipment we have purchased uh, for those um, centers and presented parts of laboratories. Uh, I would say that such uh, visual classrooms and uh, precision agricultural laboratories not only at Jame, but also at the other uh, Uzbek, Kazakh, and Turkmen part of universities established and open. Next. And uh, there's some information uh, about iMethods, which is uh, soil analysis, which has to help with soil analysis. Next. And you can see uh, what kind of uh, education materials have been developed on the Xiaomi. This is on the Xiaomi, but also uh, a lot of uh, such manuals and education materials developed with the Nikoba project at our partner universities. Next. Yeah, uh, with this, uh, I finished my presentation. And uh, as I mentioned, there is a just short video uh, about the opening ceremony of our joint research center established in the Singhis and Nikoba projects. Thank you very much for your attention. A number of educational and scientific centers operate at the Tashkent Institute of Irrigation and Agricultural Mechanization Engineers and international projects are being implemented, in particular related to the management of land and water resources, geographic information systems. Within the framework of the Tempus Geos project, a master's degree in geodesy and geoinformatics has been established, an educational program, manuals and educational material have been developed. We are glad that we can be here um, with the team. Obda University started uh, almost eight years ago, so uh, the collaboration. Then. First, we had a, uh, an Erasmus project uh, previously, uh, which uh, gave, gave the basics for the geoinformatics uh, curricula. And in this uh, just finished second project, the so-called Jenkins project, uh, we started in 2000. Uh, 17 and finished in 2021 so this year due to the covid we had to extend the, the project with six months and uh, we just agreed to have a, a common double degree program in geoinformatics uh, from tmf point of view uh, the specialty is mostly in agriculture from Obudi university point of view mostly in in computer science and uh, geoinformatics and uh, the result of uh, this uh, cooperation also created this uh, joint research center uh, with the whole new infrastructure and, of course, uh, knowledge. And with the first PhD student who just graduated uh, in this uh, term. So I guess that uh, from this point of view, uh, this is how we should cooperate and uh, increase in the future. The main task of the Joint Research Center for Geoinformatics is to analyze, monitor and manage the state of agricultural and water bodies through the use of geographic information technologies, practical solutions and innovative methods to help solve environmental problems. The center includes laboratory rooms for research, data collection and a digital subject teaching. The university hosted a meeting with a delegation from the Hungarian Obud University. Negotiations were held on the further development of international cooperation. An agreement was signed between the Tashkent State Institute of Irrigation and Agricultural Mechanization Engineers and the Obud University of Hungary on the creation of a joint bachelor's program in geodesy and geoinformatics.
Следующее слово представляется имя главному координатору данного проекта, президента Казахского агротехнологического университета, госпожа Алия Байкулай. Добрый день, уважаемые коллеги. Позвольте всех поприветствовать. Мы очень рады, что э, вы находитесь сегодня здесь. Главная цель ЕКОПа – это перенести наши достижения в области цифровизации, монетизации, сектора хозяйства в образовательный процесс. То есть мы должны создать, э, создать компетенции, привить науки к нашим обучающимся э, в данном направлении. Хотелось бы выразить благодарность нашим всем партнерам, партнерам Европы, так, так как университеты, партнеры Средней Азии за эти годы смогли достичь определенных результатов. И, конечно же, теперь, пройдя период пандемии, мы сможем тесно работать и на одной платформе, на, в одинаковых условиях развивать мобильность как академическую, так и научную среди обучающихся профессионального преподавательского состава. Хотелось бы еще раз выразить благодарность ректору, всем организаторам данной конференции, где мы сможем обсудить наши достижения, где-то помочь решить определенные проблемы. В рамках проекта НИКОПа создана сеть лабораторий ФАО ФАСА, где планируется создать непрерывную сеть, и обучающиеся работодатели смогут э, повышать свои компетенции э, уже в цифровизованном, э, цифровизованной платформе в области сельского хозяйства. Всем успехов на данной конференции э, и в подозорной работе. Спасибо большое. Спасибо. Огромное вам спасибо за такое сотрудничество в рамках данного проекта. Мы вам очень благодарны. Значит, мы там говорим о этапе. А вот это после этапа. Куда пишет технология по подъему действительно? Ну, там полностью. Very nice to see you after the wife. We have been isolated for some time due to the COVID. It's a, I think it's a great opportunity to meet personally in scientific meeting. And we have the opportunity this time to discuss personally all these issues, which can be much more flexible way and much more open way under such circumstances. So I'm very pleased to be here with that and be here so already. Uh, we are here in the joint GI 2022 and UCA 2022 conferences, which conferences are generally about geoinformatics in the in a wide sense. And uh, already in my slide you can see that uh, what is there in the radar uh, like Very you might ask how these are related to each other, and it is quite a simple, quite reasonable to understand very soon. This geoinformatics something which deals definitely with geospatial data. It means that whatever data we have, it is tied to location. Normally, on the surface of the Earth or or in a bi-direction in the geosphere. For, in order to do any kind of localization, we provide positions definitely we need a reference system, we need coordinate system, and 
This is what geodesy can serve. Furthermore, as in the opening speech, as Mr. Shakar Karakama mentioned several times, that uh, GIS is a very uh, appropriate tool for the water management. Just think about water. Water is something which we know that by nature it is always flowing downwards, never upward, it is flowing downward. Therefore, we need a, a reference system, a coordinate system which differentiates horizontal and vertical directions. And this is the point where geometry should actually contribute, since such a reference system it is geometrically not a regular surface. Quite a complex surface, it's a physically defined surface, and this is what can be defined with geodetic tools. Next slide, please. Yes, uh, actually, uh, since it is geometrically not a regular surface, we should rely on actual in situ measurements. And this time, when we talk about measurement of the gravity field, we arrive to the field of to the discipline of gravimetry. In a special case, it's a simple differentiation between gravity and gradimetry, where the, the only difference between the two, the aim is always determination of the gravity field. The only difference of the two, whether the gravity at vector itself is ambiguous or it's a spatial change, the so called gradient of the gravity vector is defined. In this presentation, we will have an overview, and I think it will be rather interesting also for GIS experts an overview how gravimetry has been started from classical mechanics consideration to the present day quantum technologies. So, next slide, please. Uh, it's just a short uh, showing to you that when we talk about determination of gravity field, it can be either determined as a as a, as a uh, arbitrarily chosen horizontal solar surface, the so-called geoid, or it can be also defined as gravity as a gravity field. In when we talk about gravity analysis, the de uh, deviations of the gravity from a gravity field of a regular body. Next slide, please. So here I will start my uh, actual overview of the history of this gravimetric thing. Everything has been started with Baron Bora Ötvers and Captain Angrian said, quite proud of him as uh, he's, uh, our, uh, he's from our nation, nation uh, nationality and uh, Actually, gravimetry, not a gravity, I would rather say that uh, geophysics itself has been started with this instrument, constructive instrument, the torsion balance. The torsion balance, if we have a sketch of the torsion balance in this view, and as you can see, inside the instrument, there's a wire, and, and on this wire, a rod is hanging, and at the end of the rod, there are two test masses. One test okay. So in this construction, what actually is measured is the if, if here the key points are the test masses. The, yes. As you can see, if we have two test masses separated in space, obviously, since gravity field is not homogeneous in space, the two test masses are uh, impacted with different gravity vectors. And due to the difference of the gravity, the spatial difference of the gravity, uh, there will be certain movements of this, uh, of, of such a construction in, under real gravity field circumstances. Actually, there will be also a torsion, there will be a rotation of the road into this one. And uh, knowing the gravity difference at the two test masses and the lines of the road, we can get the gradient that can be observed with such a such a very simple mechanical instrument. We can say it's a simple instrument because anything which based on mechanics is simple. On the other hand, believe me, if you want to derive the corresponding equations, 
to understand that from such a simple instrument, how you can get an understanding of the gradient, then you will understand that it is a typical solution. Okay, next slide, please. Now, we were, what we were talking about in the case of third question has been in the first decades of the 20th century, just arriving 100 years later, arriving in the first decades of, the, of our present century. Gradiometry is again an issue since the gradiometer has been built for the satellite application for the GOES satellite. In case of the GOES satellite, please go back. In the case of the GOES satellite, as you can see, uh, no. Okay, so if, if here what you can see is the space gradiometer. In case of the space gradiometer, we have two accelerometers separated from each other with a certain distance. The two accelerometer, we call it an arm length. The two accelerometers observes nearly the same acceleration apart from the spatial separation. It exactly works like the two test masses of the Earth's from balance instrument. And again, the gravity difference, the acceleration difference divided by the distance between them, in this case, the arm lengths, give us the gradient. In case of uh, the ghost space gradiometer, we don't have two test masses, but we have six, three pairs of test masses enable us to observe the gradients spatially in 3D, I would say. In that case, acceleration differences and gradients can be defined. In, with the same homogeneity, with the same accuracy in the whole space. And this instrument was built in the ghost satellite. Next slide. Next push. Here we can see the actual uh, gradiometer block of the ghost satellite. In the center of mass of this block, uh, the center of mass of the satellite has been uh, the uh, accelerometer being located next as you can see here the satellite uh, there with the uh, accelerometer in its the gradiometer in its center next with a nice covering because it is high tech then it must be cool next push let's make we get a, a very nice satellite actually both satellite has contributed a lot uh, not only for Gradiometry itself, but also for uh, for for the uh, satellite technologies, since it was the first satellite which has used not any mechanical uh, part. Everything has been solved without any mechanical motion. So this is a very clever solution. Uh, parallel to the ghost satellite, there have been the Grace satellites. So they are satellites to identical satellites at a certain distance, like 220 kilometers from each other, uh, which was measuring the intersatellite range, the intersatellite distance regularly during four day mission. If we consider that actually at the center of mass of each gray satellite, there is also an accelerometer, and it can recognize that the distance that is measured between the two satellites is again the similar information what was observed in case of the Turkish cross satellites, what was observed in case of the ghost space gradiometer. We can understand that actually it is a gradiometer in itself as well. It's a one arm gradiometer because in this case we have only two test masses, two accelerometers, and one line. But it also worked quite properly. I just want to try to show you that starting with an old mechanical concept, with a mechanical approach, it could have been adopted with into, I would say, interferometric technology for the present days as well. Next slide. Here we can go on. Yes. So actually, the first. Uh, two decades of our present century has been 
uh, focused in, in the field of geodesic satellite geodesic that focus on the dedicated gravity satellite missions, the jump, the grace, and the goals. I have already mentioned in some basic concepts in terms of the grace and the three goals. Well, jump was the first guy, jump was the satellite which has provided the background for these missions, and these missions turned out to be uh, to provide a very special and unique tool for geodesics. Not only the gravity field itself has been defined with better spatial resolution and higher exit accuracy than before, but also uh, the uh, gravity field could that action, the measurement of the gravity field would reach such a high precision that it has already recognized temporal variations of the gravity field. And it opens again a new era, a new uh, option for scientists to understand more about our uh, Actually, it also, well, uh, as I started, why do we need gravity to define reference systems? What is a good reference system for GIS or geoinformatics? A good reference system should be stable. I don't want a temporary varying reference system. So in case of a reference system, it is not nice. I need three coordinates at the time when it is. So because of this, when we recognize that under our present accuracy of measurement, we cannot talk about stable reference system anymore. Again, we have to change our mind. We have to understand how stability is an artificial term, how we should define it in an artificial way. And accordingly, we should understand the related errors and the related the problems, theoretical problems as well. Since uh, just I want to show you up some quick examples what uh, temporal uh, what the detection of temporal gravity field can provide for us. Here, uh, okay, in case of the grace uh, gravity field models, it is important that the uh, the signal which it, it should if it could be observed should be uh, catched by monthly temporal resolution, and also you should know that we should have a, a larger area for this minute a big spatial resolution to see something. Some examples like the hydrological insect that the Mississippi River or the Amazon Bay River Basin has been observed the amount of water, the mass of water and its temporal variations was checked. It has provided very interesting results just to study. It turned out actually that for example, let's have a look at the Amazonas. Amazonas is a huge water basin, it's full of trees full of vegetation and vegetation stores the water. For a long time it stores the water. We don't know how much water in the in the, the vegetation of Amazonas. Also we have no idea that how much underground water are there. What what hydrologists can measure is simply what is comes along the river. But GRACE is a technology which can observe all mass variation. It has no idea whether this mass variation was inside the dirt or in the vegetation or the, in the underground water. And it was a very nice uh, experience also for hydrologists that Grace have found more water in the Amazon basins than hydrology about, like 20 percent more. Actually, in the middle curve, the blue curve is, is what has been known by the hydro hydrologists. The red one is what was observed by the satellite technology. So here again, the, our aim with this satellite vision was not to get information more on the water content of the Amazonas, but it turned out that since we have so precise tool, we have such an accurate instrument at our hand, we also have the opportunity to get such additional information, additional This is just a summary that all together in the right hand side, what you can see the figure, what has been known by the hydrologists, the left hand side is what has been found by the Greeks. You can see just the different color, but in some extent, our information about existing waters and on the whole globe has been drastically changed. 
no one has any idea that in South Africa there is water. Don't ask me that, that what part. As the hydrologist about it, but at least it has been found that there must be more water. Again, when we talk about Greenland and Antarctica, we are full of information about global warming. Global warming, it says that yes, the mean temperature is increasing accordingly, ice should melt. Very difficult to estimate how much ice is melting. We can go on the field, we can do easy measurements, but Greenland, but particularly Antarctic, is a huge, but no one will go around the whole continent to get accurate estimate of the ice mass. Change with satellite technology is possible to detect. And as for Greenland, as for Greenland, it is clearly, obviously, the loss of ice became obvious, it will be green in the next 100 years again. As for Antarctica, we can see very horrifying films how, how the ice of Antarctica is falling into the ocean on the other end. But you cannot see in these films that how much the snow is compensating and how much the snow provides new ice that there is also a reformation of the ice content. So actually, even though Antarctica is, is also in a, in a melting tendency, it is much more stable than we should think about. Next slide. Next slide. When we think about grace, it is again, change must change in time. This is what it happened. When you think about an earthquake, earthquake is always straight motion. And over a short time before and after the uh, earthquake, there is a sudden motion which may impact a large area. We can say that the amount of change of the slabs are not that big. But since we talk about heavy slabs and over a large area, this is something which turned out to be can also be detected by the grace. It's a tricky way. Here we can see a time series of gravity anomaly before and after an event. Calculated uh, at, at, the, where, uh, at the location that the uh, green cross you can see on the map, so close to the epicenter, but not there. Next slide. If we calculate similarly behind at another point, we, in both cases, we can see a jump in the gravity time series. And if you just take all the jumps around the whole area, then in case of one single earthquake, you can see that nicely the edges of the slabs are appearing on the sphere. This is actually when you use a mass variation based on a satellite measurement <coughs> as a result, but you get the seismological model, very similar pattern that is estimated by seismologists. And here is a comparison. The seismic model was assuming at the left hand side that kind of, I would say, mass change in that kind of action. It is also a surface variation. Seismic and seismic surface variations. So this was uh, estimated by a model. The other was observed. And yeah, of course, there's a difference in, in, in the refinement, in the refinement of the model, but in the details, there's a difference. But it turned out that the similar cases are also only. Okay, just one issue. We have talked about nice satellite missions, Apache, they are older. They are always repeating projects, projects are coming and going. How life is going on after that? Next slide, please. What I have not mentioned to you that even though these projects are over, the grace was so successful to provide monthly time, uh, time series of uh, global gravity models. It has been by purpose extended in a way that a very similar mission, the Grace FO, which is Grace Apollo 1 mission, was defined, doing exactly the same what was done by the Grace satellite with a very slight modification. <laughs> next slide, please. And then next slide. And, and actually, so, so even though Grace follow on is now in operation and, and doing a, a continuous measurement of, of the time series of the multi-gravity models, we should think about 
the future perspective. And now, although the classical satellite gravity method, which was defined by its application, goes, I would say, over, there is no revolutionary ideas. New technologies are under development by the European Space Agency and also by the these new technologies are based on the optical and on the board that of the And here you might try to say some words about this pollution. When we talk about optical dots, for this, you should know that nowadays a block, the, the pools of a block, the tic tac, it is not provided by, it is not provided by memory component, but it is always provided by some regular. And, and stable motion in the nature. That kind of state, uh, stable frequency at along what you see that when an electron from an electron orbit inside an atom is jumping from one level, from one orbit to a higher orbit or lower orbit, for this, a certain amount of energy is coupled, which is the mass uh, energy uh, equivalence, which is a frequency, and this frequency is the phase for measuring with optical clocks. The key point here is downward that it turned out that the frequency of the clocks is depends on the height, on the potential level where the clock is stored. So it's, if it is up in the mountain, it has a different frequency than down in the valley. So the basic idea that we can do a kind of leveling, like surveyors do leveling, we can do leveling just by comparing the frequencies of optical clocks at different height. And actually, and actually, it even turns out that, that the relation between the two is quite simple. There's a linear connection in the change of the frequency of the optical clock and in the change of the potential or geopotential. In practical, you can say it's automatic difference. The very uh, promising tool that using optical clocks which will that deal of for for uh, mainly I think for IT uh, applications can be also used for the uh, geodetic purpose. Next slide please. Fold atoms. Fold is the other promising technique and I'm pretty sure that fold atom interference will be uh, linear. And not in this competition. When we talk about four atoms, these are pretty poles. These are close to the absolute zero. Actually, some very few milli Kelvin or it's micro Kelvin already. It's, it's closer to the built Einstein boundary. It's a special state of, of the matter. Actually, it, in this case, it's so close to the zero that the whole motion of the atoms it is near to nothing and very slow or the very small space. And, and what is interesting that matter starts to behave with the same duality what light is doing. From light, you know that light has a photon and a wavelength property. And the cold atoms has also a matter and a wave property. So it has wave proper, proper, wavelength properties as well because of this, because the matter waves. And it turned out that as we can use light for interferometry, we can use matter waves much better for interferometry since matter waves has much, they are much shorter than light waves. It makes it better spatial resolution. And their the speed is much uh, slower than light waves. It means, it means that we have much more time. We can increase the temporal resolution. So the new tool again that Using classical interferometry instead of design for atoms, which also provide wavelength uh, uh, properties. One push, yes. Just a quick comparison for a laser interferometer and a quarter for interferometer. One more push. In case of a laser interferometer, there's a signal of going, a, a light going into the system, which is halved by the uh, a silver mirror. One half is going to the reference uh, reflector and which entering the detector. The other half is going uh, in line and uh, reflected by back by a moving object. And at the detector, the reference and, and, the, and the moving objects, the 
the light can be interfered. The interference of these two lights can be performed, and from this we get a very fine information of the motion of the object. In case of the that of interferometry, we push a set of the, a cloud of four that comes into an interferometer. It's, it is a starting push, a starting velocity is pushed inside. And then, so called Raman bars, a certain lasers pulses are applied on this, on this four that on the cloud. What is interesting that the role is pretty much similar than in case of the laser interferometry. The first tool, the so called P hard tools, is working exactly as the half silver mirror is doing this is doing a kind of separation of, of the signal into two parts then the, the pipe was the middle it is, it is equivalent to the refraction it is working with the refractor in this in the laser interferometry and then the last the raman pool the pipe half pools is doing exactly the same what is done in the detector that the two signals are added together just but this is interferometry we still do not talk about geodesy at all this is optics let's move to the next slide it becomes optics becomes gravity if we put this whole structure into the gravity field we apply gravity on these the atoms one push this and it turns out that due to the gravity the trajectory of these waves are Distorted. They, they, in this figure, it is curved. In, in fact, what is true that due to the appearance of the gravitational acceleration, the path, the trajectory of this atomic matters will differ. And what is interesting about this would be in this case. Yes, what is very good and very convenient in this case that he actually the change. Of this, of the of the trajectories of these atomic materials has a very simple uh, relationship. The gravity is a linear relationship between the two, so even mathematically, it's quite convenient. The way to be done is simply by measuring the actual phase difference of the two signals arising to the right bars, we can observe the gravity acceleration. Yes. Since I have started with gradiometry, I just quickly show you that if we take two this kind of uh, uh, well, um, interferometers next to each other, in this way we can develop a gradiometer when we don't measure the gravity alone, but instead it's change in space, we can measure the gradient of the, of the signal. And it also has a convenient equation. Getting close to the end. Actually, here there are different concepts already when we talk about how to apply quantum technologies for measuring uh, gravity. Already, at least three, but I would say more uh, concepts are under discussions and under development. There are also quantum. Grace mission, I would say, at the right hand side, but also gradiometric missions. So there is Grace type and Gauss type mission also in the in the scope. And also in the first one, I was not talking about the chart, but I would say that it is it is a, a similar to the concept chart mission. And like this, what is more information for us basically that we are not talking about the time chart. These these are the decided. That the first quantum gravity mission will be launched and will be completed between 2025 and 2035. So, in the next 12, 13 years, they want to have the quantum gravity missions completed. What is more critical that after 2035, they don't want to deal anymore laser interferometry, they want to do all gravity missions being purely. Based on quantum technology. So it's not only a change to quantum technology parallel to the classical methods, but they will they plan to fully seize the classical gravimetric mission. So 
this is it. Next slide, please. So thank you for the attention. I hope that this that maybe you could get a view. It's starting from classical America. Uh, concepts which on their own time were revolutionary with a similar way of thinking uh, we can get into the high tech as well and, and high tech beyond its coolness it also provides all this better accuracy better, better resolution and more stable thank you for your attention Thank you everyone uh, for your wonderful presentation. It was, I hope it was very interesting for all the participants. So we will continue the meeting. Here, now we have a technical university. Professor Ola William. Research because of the resources, uh, they get to 
it showed that uh, this change that's uh, from 2.37 it's a special contrast
Assalamu alaikum, Hurmatli Konferensiya qatnashchilari. Uh, uh, good morning everybody. I'm very glad to see you all here. I'm Shukra Chokirov, uh, a docent at the Department of Geography and Geo Geodesy and Geoinformatics here at TME. So I'm uh, first of all I would like to apologize because uh, I needed to to join via Zoom because of some technical issues. Uh, let me share my presentation. Confirm that you can see my presentation. Anyone? Sorry, can, can anyone confirm that you can see my presentation? I, I, I can't hear, sorry. Okay, this is Korea, it's not Mr. Jantar, do you want me to read? Yes, we see. So. 
siz taqdimot qo'yishda ozgina nosozlik bo'lyapti sizda. Ekraningizda 180 ga katta turib olgansiz, o'shan uchun 120 yoki 100 ga qo'yishingizni so'rab qolamiz. Hozir ko'rinyaptimi endi? Mhm, endi ko'rindi. Aha. Okay, sorry. Okay, uh, my presentation is about using Google Earth engine to assess spatial temporal changes in urban vegetation cover. So uh, when we talk about remote sensing, you know, it, it takes a lot of time to prepare the data. So we need to download lots of amounts of data and there are some different types of formats we need to deal with and metadata. And there are some like, uh, Mess, uh, missing data that we need to deal with and also cloud cover and also we need to correct some at atmosphere, uh, atmospheric uh, errors. So, uh, so therefore, you know, that uh, preparing the data takes uh, a lot of time. It takes about 80% uh, of their time for scientists and, uh, but for only for 20%, uh, which is uh, for uh, we work for data analysis like, uh, you know, performing some statistical analysis and representing the results and so on. So uh, the idea was first, uh, first of all, we know we have Googlers. So we uh, all know uh, Googlers. It's a 3D view viewer of high resolution imagery. It's targeted for everybody. So anybody who can, who has a computer, they can uh, just, uh, install this API and uh, view the world basically. But we cannot do any analysis on those images. We can just visualize it, we, we can just see. It. So the Google uh, idea from Google was that what if we can uh, you know, build some cloud-based platform for remote sensing and it should be targeted for scientists and researchers. Anyone who has, uh, you know, who has some little bit of coding can you know, analyze the data and uh, process and also represent it. So this is the demo of uh, uh, the RLC region uh, uh, built by Google Earth Engine. You can see like how RLC is decreasing over time. So the idea was like uh, the, uh, every uh, Earth observation data sets uh, available publicly should be stored in the Google Earth Engine. So and also there will be of course lots of petabytes of data and it will be updated daily if there is like new satellite images available google earth engine stores in its cloud-based storage and also it has lots of servers and distributed computing so anyone can just uh, anyone can just uh, you know download the, not download but analyze the data cloud cloud-based data so uh, there is about like 300 million CPU hours per year. So it's very strong uh, computers uh, and very high performance computers. So, and there is also uh, Google's Engine API. Uh, and it's based on the JavaScript web-based integrated development environment for interactive analysis and Python. Also, we can use Python for inter uh, inter integrative and collaborative uh, Jupyter Notebook. And also there are some other APIs as well. So as in Uzbek, we say like, let uh, speak less, talk, uh, do, do more. Like let's uh, jump into the Google Earth engine and, uh, and see how we can do some analysis. Stop share. I, I will just change my presentation. At the ekran da foydalanmasdan shunday o'tkazish funksiyasini qo'llash mumkin. At the ekran da foydalanmasdan. Ah, F5 da bosmasdan turib o'tkazib ketorasiz demoqchiman. Hozir anaqani ko'ryapsizmi? Again, the current to in the house of Carta Corund. I'm on code editor on Cornetta. Aha, code the current to the house. Okay, uh, 
so this is the code editor you can see some code that i used for, to to work first of all like when i see the you know the trees are cut in the city of tashkent and or anywhere in uzbekistan uh, it's it i feel bad because uh, you know trees are very important uh, for because they store CO2 in, in themselves and they produce oxygen for us and it has lots of recreational uh, uh, recreational uh, it is it, uh, for recreation it's very important as well and also biodiversity you know if we have lots of trees we have lots of uh, you know uh, birds and and other animals uh, who can live and also it makes uh, the city cooler so it's very important therefore you know i i thought like we need to analyze the the how vegetation is changing in the city so so this uh, therefore i uh, use this code like if you know a little bit of python or r language or javascript it is developed developed by javascript but if you know a little bit of python or uh, uh, or our language, then you can easily understand JavaScript and adapt the code for yourself. There are lots of like tutorials in Googlers engine you can use. So then I just uh, uh, created some functions, you know, for uh, harmonizing different types of Landsat datasets. I used Landsat five, uh, seven, and eight to analyze how vegetation and build up areas, as well as uh, land surface temperature has changed over time uh, using Landsat dataset and also Google's engine. So here I calculated some uh, created function for uh, calculating normalized vegetation index and uh, and build up index. This is uh, vegetation index basically uh, demonstrates how vegetation greenness changed over time and build up index is like building like how. Uh, buildings, uh, building areas have changed over time. Uh, so then I basically, this is the shape of the uh, shape of the Tashkent city. Uh, it's the just a shape file. And uh, here I imported, uh, you know, Landsat datasets. And also I did some, uh, some filtering, like uh, uh, just take uh, the images from 1991 until 2021 and th this is the data i because i'm interested in vegetation cover i took images from approximately from may until august and when the vegetation is very high then cloud cover should be less than 10 percent and etc so there is like filtering issues then i also calculated some land surface temperature because it's important to know how land surface temperature is changing in tashkent city so then uh, basically I also used, if you, if you look at these, uh, the importance of Google's engine is I'm using just a browser, right? It's like a, a cloud-based, like for example, data is stored in the cloud and I don't have to download, you know, terabytes of data in my computer because there, as you see, there is like 148 time series data set. There is a lot of data. If you download it into your computer, and process it, it takes lots of time. And especially for QGIS or ArcGIS, you cannot perform this kind of analysis. So this is very, very strong computational power the Google Earth engine has. So then uh, let's see how vegetation has changed over time. This is the median of every year. So if we have like from May to, uh, to uh, we, if you have six, seven images from May to uh, you know August, then we have only one index. So if you look at this 1991, it was around uh, 0.32. It is still uh, low vegetation index. And if you look at now, uh, 2021, it's 0 0.24. It's like decreasing vegetation is decreasing rapidly like it's a very serious problem i think and also if you look at this uh, build up index the build up index is uh, increasing it's uh, obviously we have lots of buildings built up in the last uh, years so in the last uh, to make conclusion from this uh, graph uh, we can see that how vegetation cover is decreasing over the years in the last 30 years it's uh, dramatically declined so then I also, 
I also uh, calculated this uh, land surface temperature. You can see how land surface temperature has changed over time. This is the uh, in in the city. This is the like median. Uh, like a trend, it's just a, a trend of change. You can see like in 1991, the median, trend, uh, median land surface temperature was about 33 degrees. But right now it's like in 2021, it's like 37.3. So it's also a very uh, big change. And uh, it's about uh, in the last 40 years, the sea, uh, the temperature of the city has changed, uh, increased for five years, for five degrees, sorry. And, uh, and we can do the same analysis uh, for each district. As you can see, the station has decreased for each district of the Stashkin city. And also buildup is increased, buildup increased uh, for each uh, district as well. And, uh, and we can do some kind of this kind of animations as well using this Google Earth engine. Let me open this one. So this is the vegetation index. Green, you can see green is, is decreasing over the years and green is like vegetation cover and red areas are buildings. You can see how uh, vegetation is declining and build up areas are increasing. So this is this one is from 90s, and you can see how it's changing to 2020. So this is uh, this uh, shows how uh, vegetation areas are declining dramatically. And uh, also, we, I calc uh, you know I demonstrated uh, or calculated uh, some uh, created some uh, animations like this. Like this is for build up area you can see how build up areas are increasing so from green it's changing from green to red right and the important thing is that like uh, i can show this one as well this is the surface temperature so you can see if there is like river, this one is I think Angkor. Uh, so there is cooler, the temperature is cooler. And if there is like, I think if this is Churchik uh, river, this, uh, the temperature is cooler. And if you look at these, uh, you know, build up areas, the, the, it, it's red. The red means like hotter uh, surfaces. So this, uh, this, you can, we can also make maps like this. And this is the land surface temperature, first one. So you can see these red or brown areas. These are city or build up areas and cooler or blue areas showing uh, the cooler areas. So we can see how it's related. Like if you look at these green areas, so these are vegetation, right? And if you uh, if we turn on the land surface temperature, these green areas are like they are uh, cooler, like bluish. You know, land surface is cooler in these areas. And uh, as opposite, the, the, if you look at these places, these are build up areas, and surface temperature is very high. It's about forty degrees Celsius. So the, to develop this code, I you you know I uh, I'm not sure, but I worked about four or five days, so it's very uh, powerful. And uh, to run this code, it takes only uh, only like uh, less than less than one minute. So it's it's very powerful. You don't have to download the data. You don't have to process it yourself. Just using the code that some people have developed you can just adapt it to your needs and run the code easily and get the results so this is it from me if you have any questions i'm happy uh, to answer thank you for your attention
Is, is that the question, sorry? Okay. 